Hello. See, one of the advantages of online uh, is you don't, you don't have to squeeze in. All right, you can be seated, of course, after you have squeezed in. Well, if we haven't already met, uh, my name is Roy. And uh, by the way, all that thing, I wasn't supposed to do that. So probably there's a whole bunch of people in the media suite and online that are very angry at me right now because I was supposed to do something totally different. I'm very sorry. Not so sorry I won't do it the next service, but very sorry. My name is Roy. If we haven't met, I am one of your pastors, and I am a dad. Uh, My wife and I, uh, we have daughters. Yeah, yeah. You're clapping for my wife on that, by the way, Uh, but I'll pretend. Um, We have daughters who are 27 and 29, and man, I could not love them more. Uh, I could not be prouder of them. I love being a dad, but I know, and I'm pretty sure they know, that I was not always the best dad that I can be. And if you're here and you're a dad, here's something I know about you. You want to be the best dad that you can be. I I know that. And so today, the the title of today's message is how to be the best dad or leader that you can be. And if you're not a dad, don't get nervous because this is going to be very applicable to you, all right? Because it's also for leaders. And you say, well, I'm not a leader. Well, here's the thing. Leadership is just influence, And we all influence people. We influence them badly or we influence them goodly or whatever the right word is for that. And so today uh, is going to be a help to you, I promise. Because it is hard. I mean, right? Like, especially parenting. Like, it seems like there are so many. Have you noticed there are so many different theories right? And how you're supposed to parent. In fact, here, here's four styles, types uh, of leadership. Um, so there's the authoritative, the authoritarian, the permissive, and the uninvolved. And every 10 or 15 years, it just shifts back and forth. Like many of you remember, there was a time when maybe a little more authoritarian, right? What your kids need is they need structure, right? They need rules. They need boundaries. They needed to be clear when they step over, what happened like that. And then like, 10, 15 years, shifts to the other side. Don't ever tell them no, right? You just need to help them discover who they are, right? I know I'm saying that, like, that's really good, too. Like, I just realized I sort of mocked the second one. I'm not. Like, that's, it's good. It's good to help them. But it always changes, right? I love this quote. This is great. Uh, It's from John Wilton. He says, before I got married, I had six theories about bringing up children. Now I have six children and no theories. (laughs) So I have a theory for you, John. I don't know if this will help you, but um, don't go out in public with your kids with that wig on. I feel like that would really up John's uh, parenting game. But even if you pick one, right? Say, okay, this is the parenting theory. Um, let's, just, let's just pick one, see how it goes, all right? It's kind of a diagram that describes it, because diagrams make it easy, right? So you've got to have the chrono system, the macro system, the echo system, the meso system, the micro system for the developing child. And you've got to understand all those arrows, right? Religious hierarchy, local religious community, mass media, peer group, shopping centers, traffic centers, not dear God make it stop. Right? Like, if I have to do this, my children are doomed. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you one thing. Just one thing. And if you will do this one thing, you will be the best father or leader that you can possibly be. Just one thing. But you will not do the one thing all the time. Even though you're like, yeah, that's the one thing. But you won't. You'll fail at it. So I'm going to give you a second thing to do when you fail at the first thing. So here's the first thing. Why don't you go ahead and write this down. When you see it, you're going to like, oh, yeah, that's right, right? Follow Jesus. Want to be the best dad you can be, the best leader you can be? Just follow Jesus. Uh, If you're online, go ahead, type it in the chat. Follow Jesus. If you're in the room with me, would you say it with me? Ready? 
follow Jesus with a little more enthusiasm. Ready? Follow Jesus. That's right. Some of you got a little angry there, but don't follow Jesus angry. But here, here, here's the problem. Following Jesus, if you will be honest, can be just a crushing weight. Right? Like I'm supposed to be like Jesus. I hear people talk about, I read the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, the Sermon on the Mount is so beautiful. It's, it's such a great example. I love the Sermon on the Mount. If you love the Sermon on the Mount, you didn't read it right, or you're just not very smart. Because if you read this, like, if, if that's an example for you to follow, if you're reading it that way, there's no way. Like, Jesus just, he didn't just say you can't shoot him dead. He's, I mean, some of us have avoided that, Right? He said, if you even hate them in your heart, it's the same before God as if you shot them dead. Man, the Sermon on the Mount is not something that's going to make you happy trying to follow in your own strength. So, you won't ever follow Jesus perfectly. But here's what I know. The more you follow Jesus, the better dad or leader you'll be. Of course, if you're going to follow Jesus as a, as a dad or a parent, like you want to follow Jesus with your kids. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to give you kind of four phases. And here, I, I want to be very clear. Don't, don't confuse this. Um, these phases are not the Bible. Okay, so don't confuse this part with the Bible part. This is kind of my observations in raising two girls and watching other people and being in ministry and being in youth ministry. So whatever helps you with this, I hope it'll help you. Uh, but if it doesn't, just throw it out till we get to the Bible part again. All right? So phase number one. Phase number one is you make decisions for them. Now, the general, I'll give you some general ages here. This is around the preschool time. Okay, you're responsible as their parent, and the best parents at this time are going to make decisions for their kids. So I'll give you an example. When our kids were preschool, um, we made a decision that they would not be allowed to watch Sesame Street. So I, several of you gasped. All right, how did they learn to count? All right. <laughs> Here's why. Okay, um, this guy. Now, it was Big Bird. Yeah, but if you watched, Big Bird was a master at getting over. You understand what I mean by that? He would not do the specific thing he was asked not to do, but he would somehow get around it so he did the thing he wanted to do anyway. Your parent, your, your kids do not need to learn how to do this well. It is, it is something they do naturally. Like, you know, you, say, you know this is true, right? So you're like... Um, Bedtime is 7 o'clock, okay? Bedtime is 7 o'clock. You're in bed at 7 o'clock. Yes, yes, yes. So you go on in there in bed, 7 o'clock. You go back down. A couple hours later, 9 o'clock. You go by their room, right? They're finger painting in bed. <laughs> in bed. Did you catch that? We didn't say it wasn't no finger painting. It's just in bed, right? Big Bird, he was all over that. So we made the decision. We will teach you how to count and your alphabet. Some other way, no, that was our decision. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't let your kids watch Sesame Street, all right? I'm just saying you need to make the decisions that you know are best for your kids at this age. Okay, the next stage is um, you make decisions with them, okay? Now you're going to make decisions with them. This, this is around, generally, the elementary stage, so now, instead of just making decisions for them, you're trying to be with them when the decisions are made. You help them participate in the decisions. Now, please don't misunderstand me. You are still the parent. You are still responsible for the ultimate decision that is made, but you should begin to start making decisions with them. So here's an example. Um, when our kids were about this age and they needed to be disciplined, we often ask them, to make the decision of what, how they would be disciplined with them. So we set them down, say, okay. You set your sister's Barbie house on fire so she would play Legos with you. Uh, why do you think that was a bad decision, right? So you talk through that. 
And then you say, okay, so, so what do you think your discipline should be? And we, we tried to train our kids to, to see the best discipline was something that trained them. So we're not trying to punish them. We're trying to train them to be the kind of people that don't do that sort of thing again. So maybe we get to, well, you know, the problem was is you wanted to be in control. So what is something that you can have as a discipline that will train you to not try to force people to do what you want them to do? And so we would talk about that, and we'd come up with something. And again, you're responsible, right? So they say, well, I think if I just watch Sponge, SpongeBob SquarePants more, that would be helpful. Well, no, let's try something else. Okay. So phase number three. Now, you are helping them make decisions. So it's a little farther on them, and you, now you're helping them. This tends to be around middle school, high school. Um, a, a big key in this is to use questions. Um, we're going to go back uh, one slide. I want to show you one of my favorite books before we do this. Uh, it's really not that fantastic of a book, quite honestly. I wouldn't even recommend you read it, but I would recommend you read the title, the cover. Look what it says. It, the name of the book is Jesus is the Question. It's the 307 questions Jesus asked and the three he answered. Did you get that? Somebody just read through the Gospels. Jesus asked 307 questions. He only directly gave the answer to three. Jesus was big on questions. Questions are really good in phase two, really good in phase three. And uh, so, so, for example, um, you're, you're helping them now to, to make their decisions in middle school and high school right around then. And so, uh, so for example, and again, I'm giving you things that we did. You, you don't need to do them. Probably you shouldn't do them. One of the things we did is we watched television and movies and games and things with our kids that most people would probably deem inappropriate for their age group. The reason we did that is because we knew that that was the real world that they were going to encounter. And so we wanted to process that with them and help them to learn how to make decisions on their own. So for example, and it grieves me to say this, we watched The Bachelor with my daughters. Now let me say, I hate The Bachelor. As a dad, I abhor The Bachelor. I chose the word abhor because it's the worst thing I could say in church, all right? And I try, I never made it through an entire episode of The Bachelor. Like I would always end up in a room by myself watching CSI. I but I was so glad that my wife was in the other room watching The Bachelor with my two daughters. Because the whole time, they're asking questions, they're evaluating things, they're looking at the consequences of these decisions, and what were bad decisions, and what were good decisions. See, that whole thing was helping them to learn to make decisions. And so there were, co there were constant questions. And so I just want to I want to run this through this uh, with you. I wished... Uh, that I was smart enough to put this in your notes. Uh, you have notes online if you minimize and go there, uh, but this won't be in there. So if you want these, uh, email me at roy at northstar.cc and, and I'll send them to you. These are just some way to ask good questions with your kids, with anyone. Good questions. Here, they're open-ended and they invite uh, an explanation. So it's not like a question they could say yes or no to. All right? Uh, here's the next one. Uh, you don't ask a question that puts them on the defense or back them into a corner. Like we, we do that a lot. We're like, why are you acting like a jerk? Right? It's probably not a good question. Another good question. A good question communicates genuine interest. Now, especially as a parent or if you're a boss trying to get somebody to behave in a certain way, it's easy to just want to get them to what you want them to where you want them to be. But if you, will, if you will genuinely be interested, you will find stuff out. Like, you, you will be smarter. If you listen, listen to me, if you will listen to your kids, you will be smarter than if you didn't. Your kids know stuff you don't know because they live in a world you have never lived in. And if you're going to parent them, it would be good 
if from time to time you let them tell you about their world. So have a genuine interest. And here's the last one that will be helpful. Um, have a direction in mind, but not a conclusion. Like as you're asking them questions, like you may be thinking, well, I'm going to ask them questions so I get them to discover and figure out what I know they need to know. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Jesus did that all the time, okay? But don't have a, like, you're not Jesus. I don't know if you noticed. If you're not sure, just ask somebody you live with, okay? Don't say, this is my conclusion, and I'm going to get them there. Like, as you're asking questions, yeah, have a direction, but don't have a conclusion. All right? So, again, if you want these helps for good questions, email me, roy at northstar.cc. Next time, I'll remember to put them in the notes. Um, so here's phase four. Phase four is you pray to God they don't make too many stupid decisions on their own. <laughs> this is college. This is after college. And guess what? They don't live at your house anymore. And this is the only phase where you are not ultimately in charge of the decisions. And so, I mean, I'm praying. I'm just praying they don't make as many stupid decisions as I'm making. Um, so here, here's the key here is now you're available. They need to know that if they need your help, they have a question, that you're available, okay? And uh, so this one's tough. If you're in this stage, you know how tough this part is, is how much initiative do you take, right? Like you see something, you're like, ooh, that might not be good, you know? Do you, do you take the initiative and say, hey, have you, you know? Or do you just weigh back and, you know, see if they ask for your help? You know what the answer to that is? I can tell you how to figure out that out. Follow Jesus. That's the only way you'll know that, okay? Follow Jesus. Um, comes in handy a lot. And listen, you, you don't have to do this on your own. Like, your church family, we are here for you. Like, what happens if you come to the building uh, is every preschool, elementary, your, your kids are not just being babysat at all. Like, Michelle, who runs our thing, like, if I ever say that we babysit, I duck immediately afterwards. Because they are learning scriptural truth, and they have small group leaders that are helping them to apply it. And listen, for those of you who are online, and look, I understand, I'm looking out over this crowd, and I don't see you every Sunday. Hmm, now you think we didn't know, right? Sometimes you stay home, or sometimes you're traveling. And I encourage you to be uh, on the online campus when you do. And listen, even if you're not here, we still have resources to help you. So here's what you do. Uh, go to northstar.church slash kids, and you'll see this page, all right? Scroll to the bottom of this page, and here's what you get. It says North Star Kids Online, okay? Now, before you click that, uh, let's look down there at the bottom, it says follow us. I would encourage you, if you have kids, to follow North Star Kids uh, on Facebook and Instagram. A lot of resources, a lot of helpful stuff there. Um, but if you click that uh, online, uh, these are the resources that you have. I'm just going to point out two of them. I really encourage you to go on. In fact, I would encourage you to pull out your phone right now and go to northstar.church slash kids. And say, well, what if they stop listening to the message? Well, honestly, if you have kids, like this might be more help to you than the rest of this message. There's a North Star Kids preschool service. You know what? If you're not here, you can click on that and your kids can have the same experience and teaching that they would if they came and they were in the building. You say, well, they don't have a small group leader. Yes, they do. It's you, right? Same thing with uh, elementary service, parent cues and apps. There's a lot of resources there for you. So please, don't try to be the best dad that you can be by yourself. Because you have a church family uh, that will help you to do that. But these phases that I've just given you, they are only as helpful as you follow Jesus. Now, let me just mention a couple things that I should mention about following Jesus, okay? This is kind of a full disclosure thing, all right? First, like, if you're following Jesus, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to deny yourself. In fact, here's what Jesus said, Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciple, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, that doesn't sound like much fun. Well, good news. Jesus says in the next verse, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his, say, his life 
for my sake, will find it. What Jesus is saying is denying yourself to serve others is absolutely the most meaningful, satisfying life that you can possibly live. If you're just trying to do what you want, you're going to ruin your life. But if you'll deny yourself to follow Jesus and love other people, then you will have a rich and satisfying life. Another thing is if you follow Jesus, you're going to have to love some people. Now, that's probably not a big surprise. Look at what Jesus says in John 13, 34 and 35. He says, so I give you a new commandment. Love each other deeply and fully. Remember the ways that I have loved you and demonstrate your love for others in these same ways. Everyone will know you as my followers if you demonstrate your love to others. Love, you actually might want to write this down. Love is simply this. Love is desiring the good of another enough that you do something about it. Love is desiring the good of another enough that you do something about it. That's how you follow Jesus with your kids. Jesus went on to say, because it's not always easy, John 5, 44, he said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. You say, what does that have to do with parenting? You just ask that question, you're not a parent yet. Because <laughs> there, there are some times when it does not seem like this little human is on your side. In fact, it appears that they are doing everything in their power to make your life miserable. Do you know why it feels that way? Because that is exactly what they're doing. And the only way you're going to be the best dad that you can be in those kind of situations is if you're following Jesus. What does it look like? What does it mean to follow Jesus as a dad or as a leader? It just means this. It means if you're a dad, to be the exact dad that Jesus would be if he were in your situation, if he were the father of your kids. Following Jesus is not doing what Jesus did. It's doing what Jesus would do if he were in the situation that God has placed you. Let's face it. That is just not humanly possible, is it? Now I look back, there's a lot of times when, there's a lot of times when I did not, I was not the father that Jesus would have been in my place. So how do you do what's humanly impossible? Here's how it works. So, there's stuff in your life, obstacles. You didn't plan for it, but it happened, right? And you got to get past them. Uh, hypothetically, let's say you move to Panama City. Everybody in the church you're going to work for says you got to put your, your girls in, high school girls in the MAPS program, which is in Mosley. Fantastic uh, place. Great program. And so you do... And you have to drive your kid an extra 45 minutes every day to school and back. And uh, they didn't tell you that since you lived on the beach, there was an almost identical program in Arnold High School, like five minutes from your house. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> so now you got this extra 45 minutes in your day, every day. But, you know, it gives you a chance to talk to your kid, you know, if they're in the mood to talk to you. Or you're in the mood to talk to them. But you know what? It's, it's not that rough. And so what do you do? Well, you just get over the obstacle part of it. But that's not all life is. So, uh, Nolan, if you can help me out. Uh, thank you, Nolan. Some of the time, it's a little bigger. A little tougher, right? Right? And you know what that is, uh, hypothetically. Uh, you know, your wife, two daughters, you're about to go to bed. I mean, you're all ready. And it uh, turns out you got volunteered to make an emergency target run for feminine products. <laughs> Only guy in the house, but this is your responsibility, <laughs> hypothetically. And it's not that I, or that you can't do it. 
it's doing it with a good attitude. You know, getting feminine products at Target like Jesus would. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, you know, you don't get the smart aleck answer. You just kind of grit your teeth and you smile, you know, like you smile and you're gritting your teeth. So it's a little harder. So you need to get ready. One, two, three. Right? You do it. You can do this. It just takes a little more effort. But enough willpower, enough discipline, you can do it. But that's not really how life works either. Because some of the time, what you have the ability to do, and what God is asking you to do, what needs to be done, They're not the same place. There is a gap between what you have the ability to do and what needs to be done. Like, you know what I'm, like, I I hope that something just jumped up in your mind right now. Because this is, this is our life all the time, right? And I'm telling you, like, I could get a running start, right? No, I, I don't got this. I'm just, I'm just curious. How many of you think I got this? Raise your hand. Wow. Online. Go ahead. Online. Type, type in the, type in the, uh, type in the chat. We think he's got this, if you'll believe it. And then you know that emoji that goes, yeah, put that one up after that. I do not got this. I can't do this. See, what I can do And what needs to be done, there's this huge space between those two things. So what do I do? Because this is my life. Well, the Apostle Paul had the same issue. And and by the way, uh, before I show you the verse, let me just kind of set it up. He had this thing in his life that was awful. He called it a thorn in the flesh. And he described it as being torture. Okay? Okay? And so he said to God, God, he prayed about it. That's what the spiritual people do. They pray about it. Say, God, take it away. Like, dial it back in so I can take, so I can do it. So I can handle it. I can't do this. And, you know, God says that, you know, he'll never give you more than you can handle, right? No. God never said that. God never said he would not give you more than you can handle. That is not in the Bible. That's a meme somewhere. Here's what God said. Let's look at it. So it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. So Paul's praying, please take it away, take it away. And he has said to me, this is God's response. My grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected. My power is unleashed through your weakness. God's grace is sufficient. So the space between what you have the ability to do And what God wants done, what has to be done, this space that you can't get over, God fills it with his grace and power. So Paul could get over whatever this torturous thing is. So I can get over. What is this thing? Um, God forbid your your child ends up with a, a mental or a physical disability. That changes your whole life. Everything, you have no clue how much that will change your life. And now, now you're left, you, you, how do you get over this? How am I supposed to get over this? How do I got this? Nolan? The mini tramp of grace. So, but you know I can, right? I mean, look at it. Let me not make it harder than it should be. You know, if I'm mini tramp, I can get to the other side, don't you? Some of you seem to be non believers. On three. Ready? One, two, three. 
Could I have some silence in the audience? This is not, <laughs> this is not an easy thing for me. I, I'll be honest. I'm a little nervous. One, two, you know, I, I do sense that some of you are a little tense right now. Um, online, if, if you're tense, just write it in there. Just say, I'm freaking out right now. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm curious, another show of hands. Um, how many of you are just a, a little nervous about me mini tramping over these two? Thank you for your support. Obviously, you did not notice that I brought my mini tramp jump over the uh, cone chunks. These are chunks. These, yeah. Had to ask a young person in the foyer what these were. They're chunks, just so you know. On three. One. Two. Hey, Wendell. Um, on an unrelated topic, um, is the stage insured? The keyboard is not insured. Keyboard is not insured. I'm, ask, I'm just asking for a friend. All right, on three. One. Two, three days ago, I was, I was presenting this illustration to part of the teaching team. And um, when I got to the part where I'm going to bring out the mini tramp to, you know, illustrate the grace and power of God that goes beyond your own ability, when I got to that, Marty began to speak. And I thought to myself, before he said anything, I thought, you know, Marty's just about to say, Roy, th this... This is the greatest illustration I've ever heard about the power and grace of God. And, uh, and so when I, when I said I was going to use the mini tramp, uh, Marty, without hesitation, said, yeah, but you're not really going to do it, right? So, uh, Marty, this is for you. <laughs> One, two... Three, I'm not going to do that. What are you, insane? <laughs> if I kill myself, my wife will kill me. I, like, I, I, am, I am not going to do that. Um, now, the main reason I'm not going to do that is it is not God's will. <laughs> like, for me to do that, Jesus himself would has, have to appear in bodily form and say to me, Roy, I want you to mini tramp over the two pylons, and I... Because you're not worried about me jumping, you're worried about the descent, right? I will protect you on the way down, and I will protect Wendell's favorite keyboard as well. See, th there is a sense, right? There, th like, if you think about, like, who doesn't love a mini tramp, right? I mean, you can fly with these things. Like, if you put a mini tramp, like, on a, on a, a basketball court at the foul line, like, a middle school kid can dunk from the foul line like Michael Jordan, who doesn't want to fly? Like, who doesn't want to live like that? But you can't just make up crazy, stupid stuff to do and expect God's grace and power to hold you up and get you there. No, you have to do what God says to do. Like, I, most of you have heard the story about when Jesus walked on water. Jesus was out on the storm. Peter's in the boat. And Peter walks on water. But before he did, I find this very fascinating. Peter shouted out to the Lord, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you. So Peter's like, I want to do this. It's going to be exciting, but I want to make sure that's Jesus, and I want to make sure he is down for the activity, all right? <laughs> but that is the kind of life we want to live. Like, look what the Apostle Paul said. Th this is amazing. So this is just the rest of the verse in 12, 9, 2 Corinthians. He says, most gladly, therefore, he's talking about being tortured. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. He's saying, if it means this gap, this torture, if it means that God pours his power and grace into my life so that I have a power greater than my own, so I can fly, mo I, most gladly I would sign up for that than for God to just remove the problem. You know, if you only did, if God only lets you do stuff, only put stuff in your life that you could handle, you'd live the life of every average atheist, right? What is there in your life that needs God, if you can handle it all? And you know what? 
Like this, look, I understand. We're talking about real things. We're talking about painful things. And I don't, I don't want to be glib about it because, you know, on top of your problems, then somebody else gets the promotion that you should have got. And they're a horrible boss, and now they're your boss. And every day you come home to your wife and kids, and basically uh, your default is giant flaming jerk. That's, that's you when you come home from work. And the gap gets bigger. But see, God moves the mini tramp of his grace and power back then. And, you know, your kid that um, had, had that finally got that one friend. And uh, then that friend was accepted by another group uh, that was a little more, you know, popular. And now that friend not only rejected your son or daughter, but now they've begun to bully him. And there's just no way. Now, I understand that God tightens the tension on the springs of the mini tramp. Listen, however infinitely large the gap between what you can do and what God wants done is, his grace will fill it all up. And the more the gap, the more the power. But this stuff hurts, right? In fact, I want you you to think of, if you haven't already, what is there in your life that this illustrates? In your life. I mean, it's painful. Maybe it's torturous. And what you can do ends right here. And what needs to be done is all the way down there. Maybe it has to do with your finances. Maybe it has to do with your children. Maybe it has to do with your marriage. Maybe it has to do with your job. I don't know what, your school. But this is your life. And you are never going to make it there on your own. But look at this. It's right here. The power to get over it is right here. But so often, we don't use the power that God offers to us. What do we do? Well, one thing is for some reason we ignore the trampoline. We're like, you know what? I'm just going to try. All I can do is try. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna take a big running head start, and I'm gonna launch as hard as I can, and grip my teeth, and discipline myself. And what do you do? You know what you do? <laughs> you crash and burn, along with the people that you love, because you didn't use the grace. You relied on yourself. Some of us, man, we look at this, and we're like, "There's no way." This is too overwhelming. This is too big. And you get angry and and you get worried and you get frustrated. And the more you think about it, the more your head's going to explode. You can't can't think right. You can't sleep at night. And you know what? You're just, that's it. I'm in. I'm down. I'm over. I'm tapping out. And you're no good to anybody, even yourself, because you gave up. Uh Uh-oh. I forgot I was old. I'm falling and I can't get up. Nolan, thank you. All right. Appreciate it. A little, little mini tramp grace there. Some of you, you, uh, you look at this, and the more you look at it, the more angry you get, the more frustrated you get. And you think, how could God allow me to be in this situation? How could these other people do this to me so this happens? You get angry and you get frustrated and you throw pylons and you gripe and you complain and you just make everybody else miserable in your life. And you really don't accomplish anything. So what do you do? Like this is a cute little illustration But the question is, how do you actually hit the mini tramp and be propelled over beyond your abilities by what God says? Well, let's look back on the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 50, 10, it makes it very clear. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Did you catch that? So the grace of God, the mini tramp of his power, It can be useless to you. It can be vain. It can be empty. It's there, but it can have zero effect on your life. Well, why was it not that in Paul's life? Let's look. What did he do so it wasn't just an illustration? 
On the contrary, I, what's that next word? I worked. He worked. He did stuff. He obeyed. I worked harder than any of them. Okay, so let me just make this clear. If you are going to activate the infinite grace and power of God in your life, you are going to have to do something. I don't know what it is exactly. Well, I do know one thing. You're going to have to pray. Like, if, you, if you're facing something that you cannot accomplish in your own strength, you need to ask God for help. Okay, that's, one of the, that's the first thing you need to do. But then you need to do something else. Almost always. No, not always, but almost always. Do you know why? Because God's a father. You're a father. If, if you're a good father, you don't want to just do stuff for your kids, right? You want to do stuff with your kids. And our Heavenly Father is exactly the same. So he, he will lead us to do something. I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's to go and to ask forgiveness to someone you've wronged. Is that going to restore the relationship? No. That's not enough. You know that. You've apologized to people and got nothing. Because what you do is not enough. That sort of leads us to the, the other part that he's very clear. He said, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So here's the thing. So the way you get on the mini tramp, the way you get the power to be propelled beyond what you could possibly do in your own strength is you do the thing that Jesus leads you to do as you're following him. But you recognize that the thing that you do will never get you to where you need to be. So you do what he says. You obey, but you don't rely on your obedience or your godliness or discipline. No, you obey on, you, you rely on his power, which is only activated when you trust him enough to do what he says. So, let me, just, let me just say a couple things. You and I, we're in this place. And so let, let's say we're relying on God and his power, not our own strength. And we're obeying, we're doing the things that we believe he's leading us to do. It is probably going to take way longer for God to take you from where you are to where you need to be than you want it to. God's time is not your time. And he's not just about getting you over obstacles. He's about the kind of person that you become when you rely on him and obey him to overcome those obstacles by the power of his grace. And let me say this, getting over the obstacle rarely looks the way you expect it to look. And so when we're obeying and we're trusting, remember that old hymn, trust and obey, while we're doing that, because it takes longer than we want it to, and because the getting over it doesn't look the way we imagined it to, we are prone to be disappointed, we're prone to be discouraged. And let me just say this, I read this this morning um, as I was spending time on God's word personally. It said that God is a father who is tender and compassionate. Don't forget, when God doesn't work the way you want, when God doesn't work as fast as you want, it's because he is tender and compassionate. And his love is unending. It's everlasting. So don't give up. Number one, it's the only thing that really matters. Follow Jesus. But because you are going to fail over and over and over again. Like you're going to get to a point and you're going to go back in your room and you're going to say, that's it. I've ruined them. There's not enough counseling. There's not enough therapy. Like this kid's his only career choice is serial killer. I have messed him up so, like, there's no hope. Because you fail, 
you have to follow Jesus, and then when you don't follow Jesus, number two, if you want to jot this down, be honest. You don't need to be perfect. You need to be honest. With your kids, with everybody, but especially your kids, you need to be honest. In fact, would you say it with me? Ready? Be honest. Type it in the chat. Be honest. Because you are not going to get it right. Listen, if I, if I spoke with disrespect to my daughter's mom, I need to apologize to her in front of them. Or I need to go back to them and I need to confess to them that what they saw me do was wrong. It was not following Jesus. So when you do wrong in front of your kids, you need to be honest. If your kids, if there are things going on because of you, you need to be honest about those things. Now, I'm not saying that you need to dump all of the wrong things you've ever done in your life on your children. What I'm saying, when they're already affected by it, you need to be honest about it. And... Um, your kids don't need to think you're perfect. Like there's about 15 minutes around age four where they think you can do no wrong. And if you're in that spot right now, enjoy it, it is over. By the time you leave the building, it's gone, all right? They don't need to know, they don't need to think you're perfect. They need to know that you're not perfect, but you're honest when you're not. So let's close with these couple passages of scripture. James 5, 16, here's what it says. This is the brother of Jesus. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There is healing that you will never experience in your life until you confess your sins to one another. And the circle of confession is the same size as the circle of your offense. And that involves your children many times. Look what he says in verse 17. He just continues. He said, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Some of you should ask your children to pray for you after you've confessed your sin. You say, well, it says a righteous person. I don't think that's my kid. Well, um, the word righteous there means to be in right standing with God. So if your child has accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offers, they stand right before God and they are qualified to pray for you. And let me just pause for just a moment. I want to clarify something that could be confusing. So I talked about how as, our, as God's children, he asks us to work and trust, to trust and obey, and that engages, that activates his power in our life. That's not the same for people who do not already have a relationship with God. That's for his children. If you're here today and you know that your sin has separated you from God. And you have never resolved that. And the only way that it can be resolved, which is by trusting in the forgiveness that God offers you through Jesus. Why? Because Jesus died in your place. He took the penalty of your sins on the cross. And if you have never received that forgiveness, then Here's what I don't want you to be confused. You can't do anything. There is no work you can do that can earn or facilitate your forgiveness. Your forgiveness, my forgiveness, is 100% based on the work that Jesus did and our simply accepting it. And if you never have, I would encourage you to do that right now. Like just right now, just ask God to forgive you through Jesus. Ask him to help you to live this life as his child, empowered by his grace. Um, you have a connection card, if you would indicate that before you leave and put it in the box on the way out, we'll follow up with you. If you're online, uh, there's an opportunity for you uh, to kind of raise your hand virtually and actually to, to click a, a little button that Pastor Delbert will put up so you can fill out a connection card. Let us know so we can help you. But once you're his child... He wants to work with you, not just for you. And so I encourage you, your children, regardless of how good they are, are righteous in Jesus. And in fact, he goes on in verse 18, he says, Elijah was a human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crop. Elijah was human, just like you are, 
just like your kids are. Yet yeah, because he was God's child, he heard his prayer. And it's as we pray for one another. There are some things that will never be healed until we pray for one another. And I want to encourage you to consider that some of the time, the best people to pray for you are the people that you wronged. And some of the time, that's your kids. So I'm going to pray. And I just want to say that, that when we finish our prayer together, um, while we're praying, those who are going to be up front to receive you and pray for you, if you would like someone to pray with you before you leave today, um, I want to encourage you to come. And uh, online, uh, you can also, there's a, there's a space for you to click a button. So Pastor Delbert or one of our other hosts or pastors will be able to pray with you privately. Um, and so we'll make that available to all of you. Uh, if you're online, by the way, uh, if you'll ho- just stick around for a couple seconds, I want to share how you can um, participate in the Father's Day festivities. Everybody here, I hope you had some breakfast. If you don't, on your way out, grab a breakfast burrito. Dad's, there's a, a Rad Dad mug and a koozie. And uh, I want to, right after I'm done, uh, share with those of you online how you can participate in that as well. Um, but let's pray. So just where you are, if you're in the room, if you'd close your eyes, if, if you're online, just um, take a posture of, of, of just being quiet before the Lord. And so I, I, I believe everybody in the sound of my voice has probably thought of something. That your ability to do it is far smaller than what needs to be done. And so you need God's power. You need his grace. And so you need to trust him. But faith without works is dead. And so you need to do something. Start start with prayer. And I don't know, maybe that's it. But there's probably something else. Would you take a moment just quietly before the Lord and would you ask him, what does he want you to do? Now understand, that thing, it's not going to get you where you need to go. But it's the obedience that connects you to the power of his grace. What is that thing? Father, help us. Lord, I know I know what I need. There's so much in my life that's so far beyond my ability. So God, I pray you would help me. I pray you would help every person within the sound of my voice uh, to follow you in obedience, to not trust their obedience, and to experience the power of your grace so powerfully in their life that they could say like Paul, most gladly, therefore, I embrace this difficulty so that the power of Christ could dwell in me. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Have a fantastic week. Great Father's Day, and online if you'll stick around for a second.